I'm Sarah Claflin, the Education and Communications Manager for the museum. I want to give a warm welcome to Mary and a big thank you to our sponsors, the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Um, I'll be today's uh, moderator for this talk. And I just want to quickly run through the format. I wanted to let everybody know that um, this, sorry, I'm still admitting people into the, from the waiting room. I just want everybody to get here. Um, this, this talk is going to be recorded and then available on our YouTube channel, which I will email to everybody um, for later reference and to people who possibly couldn't join us today. Um, the format for the talk will be as follows. I'll give a quick intro um, in regards to Mary and her work, and then I'm going to turn it over to her and she's going to present a beautiful PowerPoint presentation talking about her studio practice um, and her work on view at the museum. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Please use the chat section um, of the Zoom meeting to type in your questions at any time. Um, after Mary's done with her presentation, I'll just begin to read some of those questions and um, she will answer them accordingly. And today's talk will end at 1 p.m. So Mary O'Malley received her master's of fine arts degree from the School of Visual Arts in New York City and her BFA in painting from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Her work has been exhibited widely at galleries and other venues across the United States. She has been the re recipient of multiple grants. Most recently, Mary is the 2019 runner-up of the Piscataqua Regional Artist Advancement Grant given by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Her work has been featured on Design Sponge, in Uppercase Magazine, and in the New American Paintings book. Um, she was featured twice in that book as well. Her work is held in numerous and private, um, numerous private and public collections. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mary. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here and taking some time out of your day. Um, I also just wanna thank uh, Sarah, Laura, and Christina for getting this show up on the walls and open. I know it wasn't easy um, with everything going on, but they've done an amazing job and I hope you all have a chance to see the show. Um, I also wanna thank the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation for the grant. Um, so today I'm gonna to take you through um, the evolution of my work over the past 15 years or so um, from graduate school until the present and how I went from being a more traditional oil painter to working almost exclusively on paper. So this is a painting um, from grad school. Um, it's about 2004, 2005. At the time I was really committed to oil painting. It's what I'd been trained in and I really never thought I'd work anywhere, anywhere else. Um, so I was using a lot of layers, um, glazing, building up the surface, um, scraping away, um, kind of leaving the history of the painting on the surface. Um, and I was working with these sort of amorphous jellyfish-like shapes um, and building them up with lots of layers and dots. But I was struggling with these pieces. They took a really long time to make. Um, they were fairly large. This one's about three by four feet. And um, because they took so long, they would kind of morph into a completely different painting from start to finish. So this is actually the same painting. The, one, the image on the left is where it, a very early stage and the image on the right is where it kind of wound up. Um, so I never did any sketching or preparatory drawings before him, which was part of my problem. Um, and I had a professor in grad school who could see this struggle and he suggested that I, I really need to draw more. So when I kind of grumbled that I didn't like to draw, um, which is kind of ironic because that's all I do now, um, he suggested that I, I try something to mix it up, like try some non-traditional drawing materials. So that idea interested me. So I started to gather up all these different things like um, ballpoint pens and paper, um, color paper, markers, crayons, anything I can kind of get my hands on. And one of the things that I found at this time was this really beautiful black paper and silver gel pens. So when I put these two materials together, the black paper and the silver gel pen, something clicked. Um, suddenly I could get this level of detail and clarity in the line that I was looking for. Um, and 
the omission of color was actually really freeing. Um, these were really immediate. I could do these in a couple of hours. These are fairly small, about nine inches by 12 inches. Um, and they're connected to the paintings that I just showed you in a lot of ways in that they, their use of negative space, the, the amorphous shapes, and they're kind of um, evocative of landscape. So I had graduated from school and I'd moved back to the Boston area where I'm from. And um, I was still making the black and silver drawings and I really loved making them, but the painter in me said, but you have to make a painting. Um, so I was struggling to kind of translate what I was doing on the, on the paper to, to canvas. And I was trying with oil paint. I even tried acrylic. It wasn't quite it wasn't quite working. And then one day I just had this epiphany that I didn't have to make a painting, that this work could stand on its own. Um, so at that point, I just decided to really commit to continuing to explore this way of working. So um, as a result of that, the pieces started getting larger and more complex. Um, this piece and the one before, they're about 19 by 25 and a half inches. And it's um, just silver gel pen on uh, paper. So they, they started to evolve and they started moving away from the idea of landscape and into more um, being evocative of actual flowers and plants. So this is a piece that I, I filled the entire page instead of using that negative space. And um, there's actually a little bit of gold ink in this as well as silver. Um, and this is getting even larger. This is about 32 by 40 inches. And um, there's just, you know, it's it's just the gel pen, a very fine point pen on paper. Um, I didn't really do a lot of sketching so much for the advice of my professor. Um, and I would just start somewhere and just go. There wasn't a lot of planning. I'll just show you this is this same piece kind of in a mid stage. Um, and there's quite a bit of tension in working this way because there's no um, erasing. I couldn't even put a pencil mark down on the paper because if I needed to erase it, the er eraser mark would show. So it was just, um, you know, once I put down um, the ink, it's permanent, that's it. Um, I did develop some workarounds and some, some tricks, but for the most part, once the mark is made, there's kind of no going back. So this is one of the first pieces that I really embraced and celebrated my love for all things decorative. Um, something shifted for me in my work when I started to look outside the art world and outside of other artists or art history for inspiration. I started to look at the world around me and the paying attention to the things that I love that I'd always loved. And I'm talking about things like decorative arts, um, patterns, fashion, things like that, that I thought that were somehow, or maybe I was taught that those things were not, they were outside of my studio practice. They weren't available um, as subject matter. But when I, I started to shift that thinking and working with this imagery, um, that's when the shift really happened and the work became more authentic to me. And I think it got stronger as a result of that. And I think the limited palette with these definitely helps to mitigate the decorative aspects a little bit, and it gives them a slightly darker mood. And I was definitely interested in the darker aspects of nature. Um, the tension between that and the, and the decorative was very interesting to me. I was also interested in the idea of the sublime and the idea that nature is beautiful and it's awe-inspiring, but it can also overwhelm you. Um, if you think about the ocean, it's beautiful, but it can also be deadly. So that was something that was an idea that was coming into the work. So these pieces are very seductive and they're very beautiful and they draw you in. But when maybe when you get up close, there's something in there that there's a spider or a moth or a poisonous plant. This is one of the largest pieces I've done. This is um, five by six feet. And this is, again, that same fine point gel pen. Um, 
And just to give you a little bit of context, this is it hanging. Um, this is at the Decor of Museum and they're drawn to detail show in 2008. So the work had become very meditative to me. There was a lot of long hours, um, intense concentration. Um, so I started thinking about my process in terms of the work itself, almost becoming a spiritual practice. Um, and the work started to reflect that a little bit in some of the imagery where I was looking at shrines and altars and that was making its way into it. Um, this piece is called Gateway and I was thinking of these hawks as these like gatekeepers to um, kind of a spiritual realm. So this is just some details of that last piece. And, you know, so why do this by hand, right? Like why spend all these hours with all this labor? Um, and for me, it was really about the process. It was um, about the meditative aspects of it. Um, I was also looking at a lot of outsider or naive art at the time. Um, and I was, I was inspired by, by a lot of those artists and their uh, spiritual connections that they have in their work. It's almost like an obsession. Um, and also the idea of the decorative and the detail being almost a pathway to the divine, which is a, an idea that's present in a lot of those artists work. So this interest led me to looking at a lot of Hindu temple arch architecture and other religious architectural styles. Um, mukarnas, which are a type of ornamental vaulting that's used a lot in Islamic architecture. Um, and I was very interested in the connection between these architectural devices and fractal geometry, patterns in nature, sacred geometry. And the, again, that idea that beauty and decoration become a pathway to the divine. So this is one of the first pieces I did inspired by that, those interests. And um, it was also a time when I was really um, itching to expand beyond the silver and black palette. Um, I was missing color in my work. I was missing texture in my work. Um, and if I'm honest, I was starting to develop some pain in my hands from all the uh, repetitive small marks I was making, maybe the beginnings of carpal tunnel or RSI. And I just knew I couldn't continue to work this way forever or I wouldn't be able to work. So something kind of needed to change. So this is another piece inspired by um, Mukarna's, um, this is gold ink gouache and gold leaf on paper. So um, I started to get more of that color, more of that texture. And you know, with silver ink, silver ink kind of all looks the same. Um, with gold ink, there's like this whole range of gold. There's, you know, there's shiny gold, there's coppers, there's um, muted gold. So that, that kind of introducing that into the work was exciting at the time. And this is just to kind of give you a sense of what they look like um, when they catch the light. So again, I'd been working in that limited palette for such a long time, I was really craving color. Um, what I didn't anticipate was that incorporating color back into my work was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. I just figured, well, I'm a painter, I'll use color. Um, but it was, it was tricky. And so I, I started kind of doing it really slowly and kind of almost hesitantly adding some color in. This is a piece that has some, um, some ink and some gouache and color, but it's also mostly um, gold ink. So here's um, a couple more pieces with a little bit more color starting to come into them. Part of the, the challenge was finding um, a medium where I could get that same level of detail and clarity um, and control that I had working with pens, um, but also, you know, something that's like fast and archival. There's, I've tried every marker in the world and not all of them are light fast or at least only partially light fast. And a lot of them aren't archival. So that was a consideration that I had to, had to think about. So I eventually realized that 
in order to get the kind of permanency, the archival qualities, the light fastness, and the vibrancy of color that I was that I needed, I was going to have to use paint. Um, I knew oil paint wasn't the right solution. I, at this point, I had really fallen in love with um, working on paper, and um, you know, acrylic. There's some debate if you should use acrylic on raw paper. Um, I knew that watercolor seemed too transparent, too ethereal. So I'd been playing around with gouache for a couple of years in, in some of the gold pieces. And so that's kind of where I landed. So these are um, some of my first experiments with, with, with color. Um, and these are all gouache on paper and um, they're really small. They're about six by six inches. A couple of them are even smaller than that. Um, so I use acrylic wash, which doesn't reactivate with water. Um, and it dries this beautiful matte, which is really interesting, the contrast with the matte of the gouache and the gold ink. So I wanted to take you through my current workflow and how I, how I create a piece. Um, so these days I do a lot of sketching and drawing. So I finally listened um, to the advice that was given to me. Um, so I do a lot of sketching in, in sketchbooks and I do sort of like one um, sort of these individual icons almost like flowers or plants or insects. Um, so I finalized my sketch, I scan it into the computer and I clean it up. Um, so then I have almost this archive or this database of images to work from. So from there, I can take all of those images and start to build compositions with them. And this is a way that I found working that's just so, um, it's really freeing because it's really fast. I can put together compositions um, a lot faster. I can play around with scale. I can mirror things. Um, it's just something that would take hours if I sketched it by hand. So it's been a really fast kind of efficient way to work. And things, uh, possibilities come up that I never, probably never would have entered my mind if I was doing it manually. So once I have a, a composition kind of where I want it, I, I sketch, I print it out and I do sort of a first draft um, final sketch of it and I start perfecting lines, I start adding detail where necessary. And sometimes I go through two or three drafts um, of sketches before I get it to a place where it's ready. Um, and to be finalized. So once I do have that final sketch, I um, transfer it onto watercolor paper with a light table. And then I just start painting. And then this is that final piece. So this is just a detail of, of one of the pieces at an angle. So you can kind of see that the contrast between the matte of the gouache and the paper next to the sort of texture and shimmer of the gold ink. So staying true to my roots as a painter, this is the surface is still um, an important consideration for me. So now we're getting into work from kind of the past couple of years. Um, so I, um, so I'm becoming a little bit more confident with color. The work is getting larger and more complex as a result of that. Um, I had moved to New Hampshire about seven years ago after living in cities and urban areas most of my life. Um, and suddenly I find myself with like a backyard and gardening space, which I'd never had before. So I started becoming interested in gardening um, and learning a lot about plants and flowers and that definitely came into the work and started informing my work. And I did a whole series here about gardens. And then, um, so these pieces here, they're a little bit of a departure from the gardens in that I wanted to revisit some of the more fantastical elements of my work, um, like I'd done in the early silver and black pieces. And I really wanted to take that idea of the decorative arts and ornamentation and really embrace it with full color, um, if, which feels very full circle to me from the early silver and black 
drawings where I started incorporating birds and flowers and things like that. And whereas the limited palette of those earlier pieces, um, you know, naturally kind of lent them a slightly darker edge and a moodiness. I wanted to go the opposite extreme with that, with the color where I almost wanted to, I wanted to take them to a place of almost like being ecstatically happy. Like there's just so much color and um, there's like neon colors and gold and it's, you know, bursting with colors and flowers, birds. Um, so that's an idea that I'm still exploring. Now we're kind of getting into the work that's in the show. Um, and these are, I think the largest pieces I've done um, using this process. So these are 30 by 22 and a half inches. Um, so I'm still just really having fun with putting all this color together. Um, again, using that gold and that contrast with the, the matte gouache and the matte paper and the gold ink. I also, I've used birds in my work for a long time now and I've used either sort of um, birds of prey or like little songbirds or hummingbirds. Um, and I, I discovered these kind of aquatic birds and I was really kind of fascinated by them. They're somehow like awkward and elegant at the same time. So I thought I would play around with in incorporating these into my work. So this is all the work that's in the show has all these, these crazy birds in them. Um, and this is that piece in progress in my studio. And this is another piece for the from the show. And I think that's it for me. So that is the end. Thank you again. Thanks, Mary. That was wonderful. I love the way you showed us your process and where you started from and um, where you are today. Um, I have several questions in the chat, so I can just fire away if you're ready. Okay, great. All right, super. Um, so Joey's asking, the piece with the gel pens, the large piece with the gel pens is absolutely amazing. How many pens were used in the production of that piece? And oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, um, and is there a second part to that question too? Yeah, there's a second part. Um, mutation number two and the birds and the bees reminds me a lot of um, Gustav Klempt. Is there oh. any inspiration that um, you draw from him? So you can answer the first one, how many pens and then- How many pens? It's a, that's like always the question. And it was funny because for um, that, that piece was at the De Cordova and they always have an educational component to their shows and they have a little, you know, like walkthrough thing with for each artist. And one of the things that they used for mine was um, a box of empty pens, <laughs> like a hundred. And I don't even know, I buy them by the dozen because I just, I go through them so much, but probably hundreds. That piece also took almost a year to make. So, um, and, and Klimt, yeah, he's definitely been um, from early on one of my, one of my, uh, Inspirations and it's it's funny that he's that kind of surprised me, but I realize now it's just he's just been so like just in my DNA, I think, for so long that absolutely he's he's definitely in there. Okay. And um Maddie, our other fellowship student, she says, I admire your ability to transform from an artist who didn't sketch out final products to a very methodical worker. Um, do you have any tips to get past? the feeling of wanting to jump into a large piece or to slow down and work meditatively and mindfully? Do you have any tips for her? Um, that's, that's always been my, like, an, like a struggle for me because I always, I get excited and I want to jump in. Um, when I had, when I was working on, on canvas, it was easy to do that. Um, but because I've developed this process where I kind of can't do that anymore. It's kind of saved me from um, going down those, those rabbit holes. Um, I would say, and you know, a lot of it too is just like a matter of practicality. I mean, when you've got a job and family and you've got all these other things in your life, I don't have like, you know, endless hours to work in the studio and I kind of have to, you know, I had to create a system where I could jump in point um, and just work even if I had a couple of only a couple of hours um, 
So it was, it was kind of a matter of necessity, but um, I don't know if I have any tips for you though. I mean, you're probably not the right person to ask. Because <laughs> if given the chance, I would just, I would just, you know, jump, dive in and find myself in a, another rabbit hole. So. Um, Maddie is also, she's our fellowship student, first year fellowship student um, in the museum, and she's also a BFA student. Um, she's asking, can you briefly go over your journey from BFA to MFA? Um, as an undergraduate, she likes to ask, um, did you always know you wanted to go to grad school and continue your journey or, or not? Or was that a linear process? Or, you know, how did you, how did you get there? Um, I always had a notion that I, I wanted to someday. Um, I took about six years in between finishing BFA and before I went into my MFA. Um, and it was process of, of kind of figuring it out financially how it would work and um, kind of getting the confidence to go back. It was you know, you're out of school for that amount of time. It, it takes a bit of courage and, you know, to get back into that mindset. Um, but the longer I was out of school, the more I wanted to go back and be in an MFA program. And I always think now, like, I wish I could go back every five years and do an MFA. <laughs> Um, there's times when I think, oh, I could really use that concentrated time and space, but it was, um, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's not a thing you, de you absolutely have to do, but, um, it was very helpful to me. It's like a very concentrated amount of time to kind of kickstart your, um, your practice and get it, you know, a lot of transformation happens in those two years. Um, Joey is asking, um, do you mix your own colors or gouache? And is there any color palette that you are specifically drawn to? Um, I don't mix my own. And I sometimes even um, use color straight from the tube, which was such a big no-no when I was an oil painter. Um, and I'm definitely, right now, I'm really excited by really bright colors and really um, saturated color. And I have some um, colors I work with that are like, uh, fluorescent are um, really exciting to me right now, um, especially coming from work that was like a much darker palette for so long. Um, so Diane is asking, how do you feel about keeping a white ground as your negative space? And how do you feel about working within um, symmetrical composition? What function does the symmetry serve you? Um, that's an interesting question. I think um, the white ground is, I've always worked on raw paper. I've only very rarely painted the background of the paper. Um, and I just, I, I love paper and I just want to preserve the surface of it. Um, especially when it, when you see the piece in, you know, in real life. Um, the symmetry, um, that's something that kind of came out of my my interest in um, sort of sacred geometry and temple architecture and all that, that those things I'm talking about. And that's kind of stuck with me. Um, yeah, and I, I, it's, I don't know if it will go back to sort of that amorphous um, kind of composition that I was working in before, but right now it's something that's kind of stuck that I'm still exploring. Mm -hmm. Um, Katrina has a question. She is asking, um, she's also a first year fellowship student in the museum um, and a BFA student. Um, have you ever dabbled in printmaking? The subtractive quality could create a negative of your additive process. Yes, I did um, uh, an arts and res resident at um, Haley Prints in St. Louis a few years ago. Um, I went there and we did a uh, on a, an edition of prints. Um, we did photolithographs. Um, so it would be interesting to do something else, like maybe even monotype would be really interesting, I think. But um, the photolithographs actually gave a really similar feeling to my drawings on paper. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to explore more printmaking processes. Mm. So is there any other questions? If you have any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, somebody asked, you know, if you had hand pain after doing 
um, several of those pieces and you had answered that actually in your talk and said you were getting some <laughs> hand, hand pain and needed to switch it up a little bit, figure out how you could uh, keep, keep going with longevity. Um, and so I think she already answered that question. There's a lot of comments, Maria's comment, absolutely beautiful. Um, somebody has remembered some of your earlier work at a gallery that was shown a little while ago. Um, so there's really positive comments in the chat for you, Mary, that you actually have a question, Mary. Um, do you want to talk about the grant? Um, oh, I just lost your audio. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Sorry. Okay. I just, I, I just was wondering if you would like to talk about, you know, um, applying for the grant and um, talk a little bit about the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. I just lost you again. I'm sorry. Students or possible, you know, artists who are looking for um, other resources. Okay, I, I heard the first part talking about the grant. Um, so I'll talk about that. Um, so the grant is, it's a really um, rigorous application. It's, it's probably one of the most um, intense grants I've ever applied for. Um, so my advice was I applied one year and I, I didn't get it. I applied the next year and I was a finalist but I learned a lot from the first year that I applied and um, I actually went to a, they had an information session about the grant um, in 2019, a couple of months before it was due and I went to that and it was extremely helpful. Um, and they really kind of narrowed in on what they were looking for, which was really helpful. Um, but it's it's a process, it's not a grant you can, you can whip out in a weekend. It's like, you know, I, I spent, you know, work on it for, a few days, take a couple of days off, reflect on it, go back. It was it was a long process. Um, so if I would, you know, if anyone's thinking of applying to it, just make sure you build in that time. If they have an info session, definitely go. And then what was, I'm sorry, Sarah, what was the second part of your question? That's okay, I think you answered it. Um, I just wanted okay. people to know about it and talk about, you know, how you applied for it and, um, I believe they've announced the, the new winner or are shortly oh. decided on a new winner. And so I'm not sure when that application process opens again, um, but you know, we'll have the show, hopefully we'll, we'll have the 2020 grant, runner, grant winner and two runner ups next spring um, that's scheduled at the museum. Hopefully, um, go away. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a few more questions. Um, Maria's asking, do you sell any prints of your work? Um, do you want to plug a gallery that represents you? Do you want to talk about how you're, how you're doing that? Sure, so I, I show currently um, at 13 Forest Gallery in Arlington, Mass. Um, I've been with a few other galleries throughout the years, um, most of which, which have closed, very sadly. Um, but 13 Forest is, does some great programming, and if you're, if you're not familiar you should definitely check them out. Um, and I don't, I used to sell prints of my work. I, I started dabbling in that and it, it turned out to not be something that I wanted to continue to do. So I, I don't have reproduction prints, but I do have, you know, print editions that I, that I have available. Okay. Oh, Sheena has a question. Let me get to it. All right. The forms in your work um, are all nature-based. I wonder how you see the digital aspects of your process in relation to this subject matter. It's a good question. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't, I don't really see it. Um, I see really that the digital process is just a tool. Um, and it's just a way that I can, um, like I was saying before, just explore possibilities that um, might not even come to mind if I were doing it, if I were sketching manually and just like playing around with scale and, and repeating images and, um, you know, mirroring things and things like that. So that's, I don't know if there's really a connection. Um, I think that, you know, the digital process stops at a certain point and then I have to hand paint it and I have to hand draw it from that point on. Um, Cause that's really what 
what it's about for me, so. Um, Maddie has another question. My fellowship students are, are on today. They are <laughs> hot, I love it. Um, do you ever try doing work in Illustrator um, and Photoshop due to its symm symmetry um, or? I've, I've tried to use Illustrator and it's um, really frustrating, which I think is common if, you, if you're not really that familiar with it. And it's one of those things I've tried to play around with it. And then, you know, you put it away for two weeks, you come back and you forget what, how to do it. Um, <laughs> but I, definitely, I, I do all my, my um, sort of composition building in Photoshop just because I'm more familiar with that. And it's just that it lends itself um, better to what I'm trying to do. But Illustrator is an amazing tool and I would love to, to know more about it. And I've always, I've seen work that people do that. It just blows my mind. But that's something that, um, you know, people sometimes ask me like, you know, why are you, why are you putting in all this effort to, you could just do this on the computer, you know? But for me, like I was saying, it really is about, it's about making it by hand, so. I think these are, are all great tools, but for me, when I actually go to, to make something, I, I want to do it by hand. I have a question, Mary. Um, what's next for you? What what are you what are you working on? What are you continuing to work on? Is there any new projects in the in the shoot for you? Like, um, so I've got a show coming up at Thirteen Forest in. Um, later this year. So I'm working on some compositions for that. And um, I've got a couple of commissions going right now. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I just kind of go with the flow and I'm just continuing. I'm going to be exploring more of the, you know, work similar to what's in the show right now and um, maybe even working larger. Mm. Well, there's no more um, there's no more questions in the chat, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. I'm gonna let everybody know that the museum um, is open. Um, anybody who is not um, on campus, you need to have a COVID negative um, test before you come to the museum. We are open Monday through Wednesday, 12 to 4. Um, Thursdays 12 to 6, and Fridays 12 to 4. Um, so you can come and um, see all of the work um, of Mary's and Victoria Albrock. Shana Gates, and then we have a solo show of Enrico Riley downstairs, um, and it's it's definitely all we're seeing. It's really beautiful in person. However, I did in the chat, I did post our virtual gallery for for both exhibits. If you can't get here or you're too far away, or um, you know you don't want to take that risk, please visit um, that link, and you can actually see all of the works in the show online. Um, this show impact is up um, until November twentieth. Um, and that's when the university goes remote that day after the kids go home and we all go remote. Um, but you can see it virtually or come to us in person. Um, we have a couple more programs um, going on until the end of the semester. Um, we have a civil discourse lab um, discussion next Thursday, which I will send everybody on the email list. Um, and this Friday, the art department um, is doing every second Friday of the month, they're doing a conversation um, with artists and I believe this Friday at noon it's going to be with um, our department chair Jennifer Moses and um, Professor Susie Wager I believe which is the art um, art history professor um, and they'll have a really great robust dis discussion which I'll also send everybody the link to so I'm shamelessly plugging all of our virtual programs I hope everybody um, gets to join us at some point during the semester um, I hope everybody um, stays well and safe. Um, Mary, thank you so much for today. Your work is lovely. And um, I'm, we're so thrilled to have it in the museum um, and be able to, to, to see it virtually or in person. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.